Thank you. Uh, so our next uh, presenter is Dr. Uh, Yoshi Yonakawa from uh, the United States. And uh, Yoshi is going to take us through uh, we several can, uh, cases. Pause the video there just to introduce the, the patient. So this is um, a four-month-old child who came in. And he has a very rare syndrome. So uh, it's called MPPC, first described in 2010 by Mike Tracy. And it's uh, microcornea. Uh, so the cornea is really small. The globe is about around normal size. There's posterior megalolenticonus, so the lens is huge. And there's persistent fetal vasculature and coloboma. Um, and in this case, uh, I, I chose to do endoscopic vitrectomy uh, just because I couldn't get a view. These corneas are very thick. You put any instruments through it, uh, and it distorts it. And I used um, a biome initially with the pediatric lens, still couldn't get a view. And so my last resort was endoscopic visualization. We can start the video. And so here, this is the tiny cornea. It's about four and a half to five millimeters. And we're going limbal because the retina is being pulled up. And this lens is very rubbery. Uh, so it's very different from a regular pediatric cataract. And here we're making the uh, wound bigger to, uh, for the 19 gauge end endoscope. And we put the instrument in and visualize it very nicely. And you can see the uh, remnants of the uh, capsule, which is super adherent uh, everywhere, as well as the layers of vitreous. And so we're inserting forceps and removing it from the ciliary processes. And it's very adherent, but we take time to remove that. That's the most important step, I think, in removing the capsule. And uh, you see the sheets of vitreous and that you can visualize very nicely from the uh, tangential view for, from the endoscope. And we're uh, uh, transecting it and isolating the stalk. Uh, and that's the main goal. Removing the capsule, I think, is the most important and isolating the stalk, treating it like a PFV case. And I always like to finish uh, pediatric cases with air so that you prevent vitreous incarceration into the wound. And so, um, I don't use endoscope for every case uh, by any means, but I think for these uh, microcornea eyes, it's really nice. I also like it for capro cases. At Mass Eye in Europe, we have a lot of patients with capros. And so I think uh, to visualize the anterior vitreous, it's great for endophthalmitis and trauma cases. And uh, the Dr. Uh, uh, Faya, do you use the endoscope at all or? I've used it for a few cases for uveitis to try to find like cyclical membranes. I, it's the 20 gauge is fine, to, or uh, the 23 gauge endoscope for with our system is is very dark and very difficult. And even with the 20 gauge, uh, I mean, your view is beautiful. I usually with the uveitis patients for the cyclic membranes, I can see enough to not cut the ciliary processes, but it's uh, that was a, a much better view than I've had. Uh, I agree. A 23 gauge endoscope, the view is pretty terrible. And so I don't even bother with it these days. And I just extend the wound to use a 20 gauge. So the next case, if we can pause it here for a second too, uh, this is a uh, two week old and with Norris disease. And the reason why we were able to examine him so early is because he had an older brother who was genetically confirmed to have Norris disease and the parents had another child. And the older child uh, presented with you know, total funnel detachments at one year of age uh, to uh, another doctor and unfortunately passed away when he was two and a half from intractable seizures. And so this is the younger brother, so the parents knew that he had to have early eye exams and had eye exams as soon as he was born and was referred to us right away. And so this video is about immediate sequential bilateral surgery. Uh, here I'm using the ingenuity system to, uh, you know, heads up surgery. And um, the disease is super progressive. Uh, it's very rare that we can catch these babies very early. And so here, uh, we're starting with the first eye, and it's a limbal trocar, because uh, there was some retina being pulled up there in that super uh, temporal quadrant. I knew I was safe nasally. That's where the detachment is. That's why I'm going very anterior. And we're removing the lens, and because the, uh, the retina is starting to get attached to it. And, um, Here's a nice view of that. And then we move the capsule here after that very carefully. I think that, again, uh, removing the capsule is the most important uh, part of the surgery so that we get rid of that scaffold that the retina is going to grow on. And I removed the trocar out of the supranasal cannula because I didn't like the way that it was turning onto the retina. So you see that na nasal retinal detachment. And here, just scoping out the area. And I'm looking for the anterior hyaloid. And the goal, uh, similar to the first case, is to find that an anterior hyaloidal face and circumscribing it so that we can isolate this retinal detachment. And uh, an important point, like uh, Susanna, you know, you showed beautifully that um, uh, in these pediatric cases, if you make a break when there's no traction, that's okay, potentially, but you know, ideally we don't want to make any breaks, so I'm making uh, extra care not to make any atrogenic breaks, and we're 
uh, kind of strumming the, the vitreous to find that plane. And here uh, I'm using 23 gauge, but I think we could have easily used uh, 25 also. I just wasn't sure what I was going to encounter. And I wasn't sure if I was gonna need the, the forceps and lighted picks also, which I prefer in 23 gauge over 25. And this is the nasal side. Already you can see that the, the detachment is kind of settling down. And uh, here, uh, again, finishing the case with air. And so here we did, uh, usually bilateral simultaneous surgery is kind of taboo in our field in ophthalmology, especially in the USA, uh, because we worry about bilateral endophthalmitis, what if something is contaminated? But it's something that I think we do uh, quite often in pediatric retina surgery, because one, the disease is progressive, and two, a lot of our patients are at super high anesthesia risk. And I think, especially, not in this case, but in ROP cases, the mortality risk of extra anesthesia sessions is super high. And so I think um, it's important, it's an important technique to consider uh, because sometimes you only have one shot at anesthesia and the second time the kid may be too sick or the second time the retina may have detached from a 4A to a 4B. Um, so in addition to this being a vision saving technique, I think it's potentially life saving. And we. You know, you know, we didn't really want to talk about it because it's a little taboo, but um, I think it's, a, it's an important technique that we did a multi-center study, and we just found out that a lot of our friends were doing it. And we do the same surgery for uh, the other eye. And even between uh, first examining the child in clinic and until the time of surgery, the, the detachments had progressed. So I'm curious, like, you know, especially uh, Azek and Suzanne, do you guys do bilateral simultaneous surgery sometimes? And uh, what would be your uh, indications for it? Uh, actually, I totally agree with you in bilateral sequential surgery, made it bilateral sequential surgery in ROP cases. We, we have um, prepared another uh, paper on this issue. It's on the way, I hope, uh, for publication. And um, actually, we are doing this for ROPs without any question, but I already started for even, even pediatric bilateral cataract cases. Because uh, when you uh, think that you can do it for the next week or so, then they may become ill, and they may have some uh, viral infection, something like that. So that it may delay the surgery and it may cause more amblyopia problems. So we always uh, scrap, read scrap, and we change everything uh, for the other eye, for the next eye, and then uh, we don't see any endophthalmitis still now. Yeah, because uh, the risk of endophthalmitis after vitrectomy, it's, as we, we say, like one in 10,000 or so, right? And so if we assume that the two eyes are two independent eyes, um, and like you mentioned, we have to re-scrub, re, -scrub, re, -gown, re treat it as two different sets of instruments, um, the risk of 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million. And so the risk of bilateral endophthalmitis is 100 million, where the mortality is like one in 1,000 for these babies. And so it's a million times more likely that the baby's going to die than develop bilateral endophthalmitis. Uh, so the next one is uh, an adult surgery, if you can pause it for a second. Uh, so this one is a, uh, uh, a sutureless transconjunctival technique that one of our mentors during fellowship, George Williams, popularized. And this is, uh, I learned it from Jeremy and Lisa also, that uh, it's a modification where normally we would place the three trocars, do the regular vitrectomy, and then place two additional trocars, so you have five cannulas in the eye, and we externalize the haptics through the two extra trocars. But here, this is a modification that one of my co-fellows, Aristanos, thought of, where we just use the three cannulas that we use during regular vitrectomy uh, to externalize the haptics. And so let's roll the video. Uh, so this was a, a 70 year old woman with a dislocated three-piece uh, IOL, and we see that nicely over here. And we use, uh, I started at two and a half uh, millimeters behind the limbus, and then we insert, this is a right eye, the first cannula backwards, because we're gonna externalize the inferior haptic that way, and I measure exactly 180 apart and place the next cannula from the other direction, and the third one doesn't really matter how you put it in. And we put the infusion in inferotemporally like we normally do, and remove the gel, And for uh, scleral fixated IOLs, I like to uh, shape the vitreous pretty well, especially where the haptics are going to be externalized. And we're lifting up the IOL capsular complex with a soft tip cannula, comes up very nicely. And then 
uh, hold it in place with uh, max grip forceps, and then we clean up the IOL. And I think 27 gauge is very nice to do this portion, where we're just cleaning up the haptics really well, and the small uh, mouth allows us to be very gentle uh, for the haptics. Have you ever broken a haptic there? Not with this step. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so this is the key part here where we uh, remove the infusion cannula from the inferal temporal and we move it to the superal temporal cannula. And so that now we're 180 apart and we're externalizing the first haptic. We lift up on the cannula and externalize the haptic uh, through the sclera uh, out of the conch. And we're going to do the same for the other side, uh, and this is through direct visualization, but you can pick it up uh, under the biome that uh, you know Jeremy likes to do. And so here's the other side, and we externalize it. And um, Dr. Yamane in Japan has popularized you know, making these bulbs at the end of the haptics, which I started doing also using uh, low temp cautery so that it stays in place. And we do it for the uh, other side also here. And uh, it reposits very nicely where it stays right at the tip. And the patient was super happy. And uh, she was 20, you know, uh, 30 on day one. That photo's from uh, post-op day one. And just two weeks after, she's 20, 20 uncorrected. We have about six months follow-up. Now she's doing uh, really well.